In the late fourth century, a story was told of a young scholar named Evagrius. You've heard of him, right? The story was told of this young scholar, Evagrius, who went to the desert to fight the devil. You did that this week too, right? Here's his picture. He uh, became a monk, and the word got out. This crazy young monk went to the desert to fight the devil, and the rumor was he was winning. He figured out how to win, and so he became this sought-after teacher of spiritual warfare. People were asking, how do you do it? How do you respond to the devil? In fact, later in his life, one of his fellow monk friends wrote him a letter and said, dude, you got to write this down. And he did, and it's right here in this book, right here. It's called Talking Back. And I believe this is the best subtitle ever for a book. Listen to it. Talking Back, a monastic handbook for combating demons. Isn't that good? <laughs> he wrote down his strategy. And what, here's what he came, here's what he came uh, to the conclusion of. The spiritual warfare that was going on was really a battle in the mind. It was thoughts that were either just random thoughts that the evil forces were, were twisting, or they were just flat-out evil thoughts planted there by demons or Satan himself. And his, his, his working theory was, we can't just listen to those, we have to talk back. It makes you think about your thoughts a little bit. And maybe we should think about what we think about. Because we do think about a lot of things every single day. Experts say upwards of 10,000 thoughts a day. I wonder if she likes me. What's the weather gonna be like today? It's still 80 degrees. I guess we live in Georgia in the fall, you know? Um, are they gonna win? Some of you were thinking that yesterday, about 3.30 in the afternoon or whenever it was. You were nervous. I watched one of you sit in a chair gripping that thing with all your might. Georgia, congratulations, you pulled it out, all right? You might have been thinking some other thoughts, though, in your head during that game, right? Does my wife, does she really love me? Man, I can't believe I yelled at my kids again. Am I ever gonna lose the weight? I feel overwhelmed. I mean, how am I going to get it all done? What are my kids doing? How, how can I get a handle on them? Probably going to get sick. <laughs> I always get sick. You ever had those thoughts? You ever had a thought where you're like, where in the world did that come from? If our, if our friend is right, maybe, just maybe, a thought is a little more than a thought. And maybe we should think about what we think about. A few years back, the research company Barna did a survey and they asked uh, a bunch of people in America how, how many considered to be Christians. And so, good news, about 49% of millennials said yes, I, I am a Christian. About 65% of the population at large said yes, I'm a Christian. Don't get too excited because only 10% of all those that responded would fall into the category of what is called a resilient Christian, somebody who's ready when the fight comes, who's, who's regularly practicing spiritual rhythms, who's planting themselves in the word of God so they're ready to respond and not just react in the moment. Christians that are ready for the fight coming at them, because Christian, we are in a war. We're in a fight right now. I've, I've heard it said this way, failure to prepare is preparing to fail. Have you ever heard that? All right, I did some study this week, and one of three people said that. It was either John Wooden, Ben Franklin, or Confucius. So you pick whichever one you want. Some of them said it, but it's still true. Like, we have to be prepared for this fight. And we're in week five here of this series, the faith under fire. You're in a fight. You're in a fire. And what we've seen every single week is Peter has written to his audience, this group of churches, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and he said, hey, don't be surprised when the fiery trials come. But now he's, he's turning the page a little bit and saying, there's part of this fiery trial that we haven't talked about yet, and it's the spiritual warfare side of it, because some of what's happening, whether it's persecution from Nero, hostility from your neighbors, doubt inside your own mind, some of that is fueled by a dark animating force of Satan and his demonic forces. And so he's challenging his audience here in chapter five, stay alert and pay attention. 
We're going to be in chapter 5 of 1 Peter. If you have a Bible and want to turn there, that's where we will be. The scripture will be on the screen behind me so you can follow along and check it out as we, as we go. We'll start in verse 5 of chapter 5. He says this, all of you dress yourselves in humility, all right? It's a literal word that says like wrap a cord around your waist. You're tying your garments in place, almost like laying out your clothes before you go to bed. Anybody do that? It's a good practice, you know. Lay your clothes out, like remember to put on humility because guess what? Your boss is demanding. Your spouse is ungrateful. Your kids, they act just like kids. Dress yourselves in humility. Why? Listen to him. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So for the third time he says, humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God. Why? Because he cares for you. I want to pause just for a moment. That word give, is, it's a really interesting word. It actually means to transfer ownership to God, to transfer ownership to something. So when you give it to him, you don't say, hey, I want that back in a while. <laughs> We've challenged you before with something called a God box, Here's a practical tool you can put in your toolbox, maybe. If you haven't heard this before, go home and get a box, like a shoebox, anything. Just write God on it, all right? It's not God, but it's acting like it, okay? You write God on it, and you put a slit in the top, and you actually physically write down your request, that thing that's weighing on you, that anxiety. You drop it in the box, and when you do, you say, God, I am giving this to you. Ownership is transferring to you. Got it? That's the easy part. If you want to worry about it again, what you do is tell God, I can handle this better than you can. And you go get it out of the box and say, I'm going to hold on to this now. This word give means transfer the ownership to God. Give your cares and concerns to him. You're in a fight. You're in the fire. But even in that, Peter says, give your cares and your worries to God. Why? Because he cares for you. Stay alert, verse 8. Watch out because your great enemy, the devil, literally means your prosecuting attorney. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Let's say these next two words with me. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. Church, you want to be motivated? Go to persecution.com and just read stories of people who are persecuted for their faith, countries that are hostile to Christianity, and read stories of fellow Christians, your brothers and sisters around the world. In his kindness, Peter says, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Jesus Christ. So after you've suffered a little while, he will restore, he will support, he will strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation all power to him forever. And the church says, amen. amen. This text, on, on the surface, it seems like a lot of different things are kind of going on. Like Peter is kind of scattered. He's talking about pride and humility. He's talking about giving your anxiety and your worry to God. He's, he's talking about suffering and what that's doing in the life of a Christian. But really, this text, I think it's more about one thing. It's not about all those things as much as it's about the devil. And here's why. Right in the middle of it, he says, stay alert, watch out, your great enemy, the devil. He's prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Let me, let me put it to you this way. Imagine your life is like a piano, all right? The, the keys are connected to strings, and every string of your life, anxiety, worry, all those thoughts, those are the strings on the piano, and the devil wants to sit down at the seat and play chopsticks on your piano. All these things are related. And we are in the midst of a fight, and if we, are not, if we fail to prepare, then we are preparing to fail. If, if we don't prepare to fight, then we're preparing to fail. And in the midst of everything going on, the negative culture we find ourselves in now, here in America with Christianity, when people are looking at you weird like you really believe in traditional marriage values, really? You're going to save yourself till marriage? Really? Nobody does that. Really? You're going to forgive them after what they did to you? Really? People are looking at you and saying, you really believe like God created the world? And that's the culture we find ourselves in. 
And all of those thoughts swirling around, I believe, are influenced or at least affected by our great enemy, the devil. And church, our call today is just to simply be prepared to fight. And so that's what I want to challenge us to do right now. For the rest of the time we have left, I want to encourage you to stand firm in this fight and just put three practical tools in your tool belt of how to fight against the enemy that is, that is against us, prowling around looking to take us out. You good? Let's give you three tools. Let's go. First, we're going to recognize the enemy. Hint. People are not the enemy, all right? People are not the enemy. Satan is the enemy. He is the force, the dark force behind it, influencing things. He is your enemy. You have to recognize him. 600 BC or so, there was a Chinese war general. I think I'm pronouncing his name right. Sun Tzu. He wrote The Art of War. Have you ever heard of that book? Few of you, okay? And a few of you have probably heard of it because even modern day, people like James Clear, who wrote Atomic Habits, is use, like they're using principles from this book. Age-old wisdom. And he says, you've got to know your enemy. Listen to his quote. Let's put his picture up there. He says, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. But if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Now, that's not scripture, but it's still true. You realize what he's saying? If you know how your enemy is going to attack you, and you know who you are in Christ, you don't need to fear. But Christian, beware. If, you're, if, if you don't know how the devil works, and you forget who you are in Christ, you will lose every time. Listen to 2 Corinthians 2.11. We're not going to let the, the devil outsmart us. No, we're familiar with his schemes. I love more of a modern day author now, Craig Groeschel. He has a book, The Power to Change. Pick it up. It's excellent. He says, you cannot defeat what you don't define. So we're going to define how, like who the devil is and how he works. For some of us, this will be review. For others of us, we need to take notes because this is the first time we've heard it. The devil literally means it's a Greek word that it's diabolos. It means the adversary or the accuser. Satan isn't actually even a name. It's the Satan, that which means the accuser. In scripture, he's called the father of lies. He's called the evil one. He's called the destroyer. He's called a thief that wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. He, uh, he is called the serpent. He is called the ancient dragon. All those just sound so pleasant, don't they? <laughs> He's not a cute little cartoon character on your shoulder whispering lies like, hey, Elvis is actually alive. <laughs> That's not how he gets you. Like, he wants to take you out. He's prowling looking to devour you. You know, one, some biblical scholars think that, that Jesus, since he never called Satan an actual name, he just gave him titles, it was like a subtle dig, like, I'm not even going to call you a name, dude. You're not even worth my time call you a name. I kind of like that. Other scholars believe that since he doesn't have a name, it's almost like Harry Potter, he who shall not be named, right? Did I say that right? But you could see the, the value in both, right? Like Satan is way, or Jesus is way more powerful than Satan. He doesn't have to fear him, but we need to be aware of who Satan is and how he is scheming against us. Here are three of Satan's most common lies. Because here's what Satan's going to try to get you to do. He's always done this. He's, he's trying to get you to doubt who God is. He's trying to get you to doubt who you are. And he's trying to get you to doubt what really makes you happy. Think about the first pages of scripture. What were his words to the first woman, Eve? Did God really say that? Don't you want to eat that? Because it would make you feel good. It would make you happy. He hasn't really changed his strategy. He says things to you like God's holding out on you. If God really loved you, you wouldn't have gone through that. It's been a hard week. You need to, you need to de-stress a little bit. One drink won't, one drink won't matter. God is going to forgive you anyway for, for that habit. It's not a big deal. Everyone's doing it anyway, you know. And he'll just slide in and get you to compromise in small areas that turn into big regrets. 
just think about it for a moment. If, if you were to pick one of those doubts, how do you think you are most susceptible to Satan's tactics right now? To doubt who God is and his goodness? To doubt who you are and your identity through Jesus? Or to doubt the things that truly make you happy? Satan's coming after you with one of them. And Christian, we're not going to let Satan outsmart us. We are familiar with his schemes. We're going to be aware. And then step two, we are going to resist. Once we recognize the enemy, we are going to resist him. We are going to push back. We will talk back to the enemy. We will resist the enemy. We will liberate ourselves from lies with the weapons of truth. We resist our enemy with the truth. I love uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul writes, we're going to capture rebellious thoughts. It's like violent language. We're going to capture rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey. It's, it's like we're, we're training ourselves. It's, it's daily that we're doing this. The Navy SEALs have this, uh, this, this phrase, this quote they made popular, that we don't rise to the occasion, but we sink to the level of our training. You ever heard that? So we're going to train ourselves as we resist the enemy. This book, you know, you'd think, Evagrius of Pontus, Talking Back, a monastic handbook for combating demons. Sounds fancy, and you'd think it's filled with a bunch of magical incantations or things that you could say only in Latin, and then they work, you know? 498 entries in this short little book. Every single one of them talks back to the false lie with the truth of scripture. Now, I'm not going to read all 498, but can I read two of them? Against the soul that has suffered wrong and wants to do wrong as well. Ever been there? You want to get back at somebody? They hurt you? This is an indication of an evil passion belonging to a soul that loves vain things. And listen, he talks back with Proverbs 24, 29. Do not say, as he treated me, I will treat him, and I will repay the wrong he has done me. Don't say that. Proverbs 24. Against the demon that brings me to the sins of my youth. Christian, have you ever been reminded of something you did? You ever been accused you're not good enough or you failed too hard. Listen, the Holy Spirit will convict you. He will not condemn you. Satan will condemn you. He will try and he will lie to you. He will tempt you. The Holy Spirit convicts you. That's not, that's not what the Spirit does. So against that, that thought, that demon, here's what he says. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. He talks back to it and we need to learn to talk back. And I, I just want to share one thing I did this week, how I talked back to a distraction in my life. And it was, it was simply that. It was, it was distraction. It wasn't like to do anything horribly wrong or bad. I just honestly, if I'm being vulnerable, would wake up in the morning, I would, I would do some prayer, some journaling, some Bible reading, and sometimes I get going and I just forget and one of the biggest ways I'm, I think, attacked is I just get distracted. And so I set an alarm at 11.50 a.m. I said, I'm not going to do this. I set an alarm on my phone right before lunch, 11.50 a.m. And here's what I wanted to remind myself this week. Rather, I think it's what the Holy Spirit wanted to remind me of this week. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. I read this several days this week. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Now listen to this. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. That's what it was. It was five minutes out of my day, but it recalibrated where my attention was going. Maybe that would be helpful. Set an alarm and replace the lies with the truth. Talk back to them. So where do you need to talk back? Because for some of you, I know you are feeling overwhelmed. 
And the lie that you will be tempted to believe is that you, you won't be able to do it because there's just too much. And you need to talk back to that lie with the truth of Jesus where he says, come to me if you are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Some of you, you're feeling like what you, like what you did was too much or God could never forgive that, or God would never like you or want you because it was too much, and you need to talk back to that. And the words of Romans that say, no, while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. Not when I cleaned myself up, not when I was perfect, not when I understood doctrine or theology well. It was while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. And you rest in that truth. Maybe it's 1 John 3, 1, and you say, what kind of love is this? This is incredible that God has called me his child. I don't know where you need to talk back, but you first, you identify where the enemy is coming at you and you resist him by replacing lies with truth. You talk back. Christ in you is stronger than wrong desires in you. We know that. But Christ in you is also stronger than the wrong thoughts in you, and you replace the lies with the truth to liberate yourself with the weapon of truth. You recognize your enemy, you resist your enemy, and then finally, you rest. You rest in God's promise. God has given you lots of promises in the scripture, and specifically, if you've been with us for five weeks, we've given you a promise from First Peter. Peter gives you a promise. You will suffer. <laughs> Life's going to be hard, right? And a couple weeks ago, Adam said this. I'm going to steal it from him. I love what he said. That sounds negative. Let's turn it positive, all right? Here we go. I'm positive that you will suffer, all right? You will experience hardship, and it's really just a quote we're stealing from Jesus. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. Why? Because I've overcome the world. And so there's all these promises through, through the Bible, but this is, this is one of them, of 1 Peter, like we're going to suffer, but just as clearly in the book of 1 Peter that we will suffer is the promise that that suffering will turn into glory. Look at 1 Peter 5, verse 12. Peter is wrapping up his letter, and he says, my purpose in writing this letter to you is to do what? It's to encourage you and assure you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace. Now that stopped me this week because that word grace is a Greek word charis that means gift. So God gave us a gift of suffering, of struggle, of pain. Listen to what he says next. Stand firm in this grace. Earlier we were challenged to stand firm against the devil. Now we're challenged to stand firm in grace. And so we, we rest. We rest in the promise of God. No weapon formed against us will stand. We rest in the promise of God that this suffering that we're experiencing is turning into eternal glory. We rest in the promise that First Peter has said that we are, we are no more a victim of suffering than gold is a victim of the fire. We remember the words of Peter all throughout this book, like if we suffer, we're partners with Christ. That when we suffer, when we go through hardship, we are being built into living stones, into a new temple of which Christ Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Like these are the promises we have. We, are, we have this promise that when Jesus Christ is revealed, if we have suffered, Jesus is revealed on that last day. He rides his white horse and he gives us praise and glory and honor because everything Jesus deserves, we get because everything we deserved, Jesus already took. Those are the promises that we stand in, that we rest in as we resist our enemy, as we recognize what he's trying to do to us. Because here's, here's the bottom line, church, for today. Bottom line is this. The truth is what's going to set you free. The truth sets you free. From, it'll liberate you from the lies. Satan is coming at you with twisting the pain into like, hey, it's just purposelessness. It doesn't matter. Like, if God loved you, you that wouldn't happen. But no, it's, it's a grace that God is helping us stand in. We resist the lies with the truth. It sets us free. So here's the challenge. I want you to identify 
one lie this week and fight it. Like, fight one lie. You think back to that outline. You recognize how Satan is coming at you. You recognize, is he getting you, is he tempting you to believe something wrong about God, to doubt God? Is he tempting you to doubt yourself and your identity that God has spoken over you through Jesus Christ? Or is he tempting you to doubt what truly will make you happy? Identify it and then fight it by replacing the lie with the truth. If you want to set an alarm, 11.50 is a good time. I'll see you tomorrow and we'll remind ourselves together. Because here's, here's just the truth. Like we have an enemy who's against us. And sometimes as Christians, I think we're guilty of reading this verse the devil is prowling around like a, like a lion. We kind of just skim over it like it's not that big of a deal. Like he's just a cartoon character. He's just a figment of our imagination. But he is real and he is prowling. And he wants to take you out. That word devour. I want to hop back up there just for a minute. Verse 8. It says he wants to devour you, Christian. That word literally means drink down. Like, he wants to drink you down. He wants to guzzle you down. He wants to eat you up, leave no trace. He is your enemy that wants to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you. But I have good news today, because that word devour, it's used another time in the New Testament, and it's used of another lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. His name is Jesus Christ, who came and died and resurrected for us. And here's where it's used. I love this. First, First Corinthians 15 talks about the resurrection of Jesus, the power that that gives us. And here are the words of 1 Corinthians 15. Listen, death has been swallowed up. Same word. Swallowed up in victory. So then Paul writes, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? It's been swallowed up. The, the, the power of sin is death, but that's been swallowed up. So thanks be to God who gave us the victory in Christ Jesus. So Christian, as we wrap up today, this message and this series in 1 Peter, let me talk to two groups of people. Christian, have hope because Jesus has swallowed up death. Satan wants to devour you. Jesus devoured death already and you stand firm in that hope if you do not have that hope today. Satan is out to devour you and you have no one to protect you. And so my plea with you is to reach out to the one who has already reached to you, to plunge your past in baptism, to experience that blessing of God saving you, to reach out to him. Don't delay a moment longer. We're going to pray, and I'm going to be here at the front. If you have a connection card as well, or online, you have a website, corinth.cc slash decided. Make the most of this opportunity and this night, or this, this time. Jesus is good and he has conquered death. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are, for what you have done. We thank you for this book of 1 Peter, and, and we do pray that, like many Christians around the world, it's become a manual of how to stand strong in persecution and hardship and the trials of life. So we pray that the truths that we have learned these last five weeks would go with us, and that we would stand firm in the grace that you have sent our way. We pray, Lord Jesus, you help us to recognize our enemy to resist our enemy, but most of all, to rest in your promise, to stand firm in your truth, Lord Jesus, that we would have a glimpse of you more than anything. Lord, we, we love you, and we, we don't have anywhere else to turn. Like Peter himself said, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so we pray, thankfully and gratefully, in your name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen.